warm welcome back to another session in the series of meeting an expert as asia pacific institute of information technology we are honored to host this session today with a known novice at the same time amazing expert who will be having a lot of insights into you at the same time to the students and at the same time to the guests so let me warmly welcome all our students who are in the platform today and also all our members who are joining from partner universities and all the foreign delegates and diplomats who are joining us today from all over the world and of course our distinguished guests who are coming to join us today from the corporate world so to start with the session today let me hand over to dr rohan tatu korala enjoy and have a wonderful experiential session today dr rohan tatu over to you thank you very much kaushali and i think it's an absolute honor for me to introduce um shamil joseph perera a president's council uh received his primary and secondary education at st joseph's college and went on to secure his higher education at sri lanka law college and subsequently to courts as an attorney at law he was inducted as the member of the bar association of sri lanka on the 16th of november 1984 and exactly 28 years later 16th of november 2012 he was appointed as the president's counsel a graduate of the university of colombo with a bachelor of law degree he went on to qualify as a solicitor for england and wales with a 37 year legal history mr pereira today is senior counsel of sri lanka with a broad experience and expertise in legal spheres of company law labor disputes industrial law property law intellectual property law finance law administrative law insurance law commercial agreements banking and public law with special emphasis on commercial arbitration and money recovery litigation he is engaged in active practice in labor tribunals district courts commercial high courts of the western province the appellate courts and the superior courts he also possesses extensive experience of handling both sri lankan and international commercial arbitrations and participated in international arbitrations held in rome italy he regularly functions as the chairman and arbitrator at various types of commercial arbitrations held in sri lanka Mr Shamil Pereira is a legal advisor to the Catholic Bishops Conference and is a personal legal advisor to his eminence Malcolm Can Cardinal Ranjit. It's an honor sir to have you in our midst and I sincerely thank you for the um, for accepting this invite um over to you um uh, Mr Shamil Joseph Pereira President's Council who will talk about the legal implications of the East attack commission of inquiry over to you sir thank you rohan thank you very much for that introduction um, i start off with uh, before i start i need to stress the point that yesterday 25 indictments were filed in the high court and therefore certain evidentiary material from the commissions of inquiry report uh, i would not be going into that for various ethical reasons uh, because it would not be correct as it is sub judice and also uh, i would also like to say that this is purely a legal discussion devoid of any politics it's purely a legal discussion now coming back to the attacks so coming back to the attacks these attacks took place on the 21st of april 2019 and that was a day that was sacred to all of us to all catholics and christians because that was the day that we commemorated the resurrection of jesus christ so it was a very sacred day and generally people the families get together and go for mass 
this was one of the reasons why you find in Katua Pitiyas and Sebastian's church, many families were affected because all the families together, they go for mass. Whereas in Anthony's shrine, is a shrine in Kuchikale, uh, there the families don't come as a, as a family. A lot of people who do come, but they don't really come as a family. So the, the worst affected, as far as the Roman Catholic Church is concerned, was at St. Sebastian's Church, Katuapitiya. Now this slide would show the places where the bombing took place. The slide on the extreme left is St. Anthony's Katuapitiya, St. Sebastian's Katuapitiya. Then the middle one is St. Anthony's Shrine, Kochikade. And on the extreme right is the Zion Church. And then there were four hotels, the Cinnamon Grand, the Shangri-La, Kingsbury, and the, 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 the fourth, not a hotel, but that's the Tropical Inn. Within a few minutes after these attacks, or a few, maybe within a span of a uh, uh, very short time, information was received and that was circulated in the public domain that there was evidence of a possible attack. Now this led to a lot of heartburn, especially among the Christian community. Now this slide that is there would show the deceased and the injured. And you would see in St. Anthony's Shrine in Kochikade, there were 50 diseased, 102 injured. St. Sebastian's Church, Katua Pitya, 108 diseased, 280 injured. Zion Church in Batiklo, 30 diseased and 79 injured. And the four hotels, uh, the three hotels, the uh, amounts are spelled out there, the deceased and the injured. Within the next slide. Thereafter, on the 23rd of April, 2019, that is within four days after the attack, the ISIS claimed responsibility for the Easter Sunday attack. The government of the day initially had a committee comprising of three people, which was called the Malal Buddha Committee. Thereafter, there was a parliamentary select committee that was appointed. And finally, as the church the Roman Catholic Church was not satisfied with what had transpired in the committee as well as in the select committee. They wanted a special, they wanted a commission of inquiry to look into this. Consequent to this, consequent to this uh, appeal by His Eminence, the President appointed a five-member panel commission of inquiry. Now, I will first look into the legal aspects of the commission of inquiry that is displayed on the screen. The commission of inquiry act is an act to enable the appointment of commissions of inquiry to prescribe their powers and procedures to facilitate the performance of their functions and to make provision for matters connected with or incidental to the aforesaid matters. I refer in particular to section 7.1 of the Commissions of Inquiry Act, which specifically states 
that a commission appointed under this act shall have the power to summon any person residing in Sri Lanka to attend any meeting of the commission to give evidence or produce any document, etc. So, people who reside outside Sri Lanka cannot be summoned in terms of the law to give evidence or to attend to any meeting of the commission. Now, the inquiry section 7 further stipulates uh, subject to any direction contained in the warrant to admit or exclude the public from the inquiry or any part thereof and to admit or exclude the press from inquiry or any part thereof. That is the reason why some of the evidence was led in camera. And section 16 of the Commissions of Inquiry Act spells out that every person whose conduct is the subject of inquiry under this act or who, who in any way is implicated or concerned in the matter and the inquiry shall be entitled to be represented by one or more attorneys at law at the whole of the inquiry and any other person who may consider it desirable that he should be so represented may by leave of the commission be represented in the manner aforesaid. So there were a number of witnesses who were summoned who uh, Section 16 notice was issued to them prior to their being summoned, requesting them that if they so desired, they could be represented by their lawyers. This was to give absolute transparency and in terms of the act. Now, I will come to the mandate of the commission, which is very important, to call and receive public complaints, information and other materials against public officers, servants or other persons who were working at that time or who still work or any other persons who are alleged to have direct or indirect connections to the bomb explosion that took place on 21st April 2019, causing loss of life or damage to properties or regarding acts of abuse or misuse of power and other such alleged acts of omissions. And uh, it further mandated to identify persons and organizations who are directly or indirectly connected to these terrorist acts referred to in the above paragraph and also to identify officers and authorities responsible who fail to predetermine that a terrorist and extremist activities of this nature would take place within the country and to ascertain matters incidental to it and who failed or neglected to take action according to law and not taking proper actions in this regard. So on a reading of this, on a reading of this, it is clear that there are two elements. One is those who actually perpetrated the attacks and secondly, those who were negligent. Now, yesterday's indictment covers or seemingly covers those who were responsible for the attack. There is another segment that would be presumably done thereafter. And we continue to identify all authorities who are responsible for failure to prevent the terrorist attacks that took place on 21st of April 2019 and to identify the authorities who failed to perform their duties and did not take proper action due to incapacity. To identify persons, organizations, who aid and abet actions which cause racial and religious disturbances or give support for such acts within the country 
and which caused public unrest and which dis disturbed the social order and disrupted the social integrity and caused racial disturbances. Further, it says, I'm reading the mandate because the mandate is very important. Everything revolves on the mandate to ascertain the, cir the circumstances and causes that led to, to the to the nature and particulars of the incidents which took place in the island on 21st April 2019 and resulting in death or total dis disablement or injury to persons, the destruction or damage of property belonging to or in the possession of any state institution or state or place of religious worship or private institution. And then to identify which of these acts come within the ambit of matters referred to above should be forwarded to the commission to investigate allegations of bribery or corruption or to the police or to any other law enforcement authority or statutory body for the conduct of necessary investigations and inquiries with the view to instituting criminal proceedings against persons alleged to have committed those offenses. So we have the third element, that is, even the, the commission has the power to forward, to, to seek the government to forward uh, these various findings to the bribery or corruption committee for them to take further action. Then to transmit to the attorney general such material on investigations and inquiry, enabling the Attorney General to consider the institution of criminal proceedings against persons alleged to have committed the said offenses. Now, the government of the day, by an extraordinary gazette, number 2141 stroke 88, appointed this five member panel. The chairman of the panel was His Lordship Justice Janak de Silva, who was then in the Court of Appeal and subsequently presently he has been elevated to the Supreme Court. Then there was Justice Nisankar Bandula Karunaratna, who is also a sitting judge of the Court of Appeal. His Lordship Nihar Sunil Rajapaksha, who, who had retired as a judge in the Court of Appeal. Uh, Honorable Atapattu Liyanage Bandula Kumar Atapattu, who, was a who, who is a retired High Court judge, and Mrs. Adhikari, who was a secretary of the Ministry of Justice. Now, subsequent to the appointment of this commission, the commission gave a notice to the members of the public. That notice is spelled out here, where any member, any member of the public could come and state their whatever they whatever they their, uh, whatever they wanted to regarding the Easter Sunday Bond Commission. And they had to do so by way of an affidavit. And the evidentiary material, if they had, they had to place that. And then the commission would look into that. And if they found that there was some merit in those complaints, all those people were called to give evidence before the commission. There, I must tell you there that there, were, there have been frivolous complaints. So those complaints... Uh, without any evidentiary value, those parties were not called to give evidence. So this, uh, there were two notices. Uh, this was on the 20, uh, sorry, there were two notices in the, in the all three languages, English, Sinhala and Tamil, uh, on two separate dates. So the, and this was a, a almost a half page notice where anybody who wanted to complain could complain. 
and this was at the very commencement of the commission. Subsequently, even members of the public thereafter who had who needed to complain, although the time limit had expired, were still permitted to come and make any complaint which they thought was relevant together with evident evidence uh, which they which they had. And those parties also, if their evidence was relevant, were called before the commission. The commission, a, a number of statements were recorded by the investigating team. And after considering the evidence in the statements, the commission examined a number of witnesses and their evidence is recorded in the proceedings. The commission also made site visits to the eastern province as well as to the churches that were involved in this bomb explosion. There were a number of officers from the Attorney General's department headed by Ms. Ayesha Jinasena, President's Council, Additional Solicitor General, who assisted the commissioners and there was an invest separate investigation unit headed by Mr. Mahesh Valikhanna, Senior Deputy Inspector General of Police. And I must tell you that in spite of work stoppage owing to the COVID Going to the COVID, uh, going to COVID, we had, uh, we had, on two occasions in March, the sittings were postponed for two months, and thereafter in October, the sittings were postponed for 15 days. In spite of all that, within 15 months, having sat for 15 months, the commission made out its report. Having participated in the commission for the entirety of the 15 months of its duration, because we as the principally affected party, by His Eminence the Cardinal, we were allowed to be present at all the sittings, which we did. I can honestly say because I was there, that owing to the work of the commission, a number of matters which were hitherto not in the public domain came to light. All that was because of the hard work and commitment of the commission. There were times where we sat I can remember five occasions where we sat at two o'clock at ten o'clock in the morning. There was a break for lunch. There was a, a break for uh, tea. Then there was another break, short breaks for, for dinner. And on five occasions, we went on till two o'clock in the morning. On a number of occasions, we went on till one in the morning. And almost on, on all days, other than that, by the time the sittings concluded, it was about 11 or 12 midnight. And the commissioners were back at work at 10 o'clock the following day. And there have been occasions, I must tell you in light of him, that uh, I used to send WhatsApp messages to my brothers who were abroad, who were concerned about the work that was going on. Uh, I used to send them messages and also to my juniors that this is a train without brakes. That was the manner in which the commissioners as well as the lawyers, the Attorney General's Department, the way we worked. It was very, very strenuous, but uh, 
the drive and the passion of the commissioners needs to be appreciated. I know that personally because I was present. Now, this is a picture of Saharan, who was the leader of the so-called terrorist group. That's right. Prior to the attack, this was this, the next picture was also out in the public domain. Prior to the attack, there was a, a meeting of all the main uh, terrorists involved in this and this picture was shared in the public domain. Saharan in the middle and the rest with their faces all covered. This was the day that apparently this was the day on which they took the oath to carry out the bomb attacks. These are pictures of the perpetrators of the attack. The suicide cardalist, Shangri-La Hotel, Mohammed Qasim, Mohammed Zaharan. There were two bombers at the Shangri-La Hotel. Mohammed Ibrahim, Cinnamon Grand, Mohammed Ibrahim. Uh, Kingsbury, Mohammed Azad, and the Katua Pitya bomber, uh, Astun, the Kochika Day bomber, Ahmed Musat, Muat, and then uh, Mohammed Naza, Mohammed Assad, and Mohammed Latif, uh, who was a tropical inn, and then uh, Fatima Ibrahim. These were the bombers who committed suicide. The two Ibrahim brothers, one one was the bomber involved with the Shangri-La Hotel and the other one, number two and three, is uh, the one at Cinnamon Grand. Yes. My experience, having been in the commission for these 15 months, We were given the opportunity of cross-examining all the witnesses. And we did so by video clips, interviews given to the news, as well as photographs. Evidence of victims by way of clips, which were all marked and tendered to the commissioner. This was something new because uh, this, uh, the video clips were presented to my own, as far as I am concerned, it was the first time that I experienced this. And then there were technical officers, there was a technical officers unit to handle all the, uh, whatever evidence that was led, there was a technical officers unit who was there to handle it. Evidence was also led by way of video conferences. I must also tell you that I have made a lot of enemies going to my participation, going to my very active participation at this commission. 
I have been threatened by a number of people, including threats leveled outside the country in the quest for justice for my people, for those innocent victims of man's inhumanity to man. But as a church, we will not give up the cause for justice. On the other hand, on the other hand, I have discovered personally the power of God within me during my work at the commission. The awesome power of God I felt within me. I have made friends for life also during this period of time in the commission. They were, so as to say, like knights in shining armor, sent by God to help me. As far as the Easter bomb blast is concerned, no amount of regret over what has happened would change the past. And no amount of anxiety about what is to happen could change the future. However, any amount of, of gratitude and love would always change the future. So that is what is important. Whatever has happened, has happened. But we need to go forward with love, forgiveness, because that would change the future. Finally, I would like to say that all these experiences have brought within me the deep knowledge that there is a God above and that God would help me. As Mother St. Teresa said, I, I was just a, a pen in the hand of a loving God who, would have, who helped me throughout this journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Pereira. Uh, it was a very professional um, synopsis of what actually happened and the sequence as to how things are going to unfold. Um, I just um, was able to um, uh, do some uh, research of my own and I like to share a few of them. I hope you wouldn't mind. No so, um, uh, so thank you very much, and 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 as you very rightly said, uh, you mean you do you you've been right across that commission giving support, and it's it's excellent uh, of some of the. Uh, findings you shared and the processes you followed. And um, um, I mean, I, I just picked up this from your Facebook on, um, on the, how ASOS, the billionaire, thanks Scotland for the support after three kids were killed in the Sri Lankan attack. And, you know, uh, it's been almost what, exactly 16 years uh, that you, um, uh, 16th of November uh, 20, uh, 2012 that you took oaths um, uh, in terms of uh, being uh, President's Council and it was exactly 36 years back that you um, took oaths as a lawyer so I know you're very close to your mom 
and uh, um, I'm sure she must be very proud of uh, this great task you're doing to bring justice in place. And I was able to pick up a few um, beautiful pictures that I saw and uh, the good times that, that I think uh, you shared. And I'm sure she must be proud of you wherever she is. And uh, I, I just thought I, I need to just highlight and acknowledge the kind of work which you'd been doing. And of course, um, I mean, if I may, before I go to your dad, uh, as a senior lawyer um, who has done um, so much of work and got so much of understanding, what is your explanation as to why this very tragic event uh, took place. Well, what is your view, sir, on that? Yeah. Uh, Rohan, it's, uh, um, it's a very difficult question to answer because uh, I'm not a priest. Uh, this, is, this is the question that most Catholics are asking today. Why? Why did it happen on the day that is sacred? to all of us, to all Christians and Catholics. Why, why did it happen? So I have also been looking up, I have also been doing my own research on this matter. And I came across this beautiful quote by Archbishop, late Archbishop Fulton Sheen, where he said, the cross had asked the question, the resurrection had answered them. The cross had asked, why does God permit evil and sin to nail justice to a tree? The resurrection answered that sin having done its, having done its worst might exhaust itself and thus be overcome by love that is stronger than either sin or death. So if our Lord on the cross could have suffered, he was the maker, the almighty, and if God permitted his own son to suffer like this, how can we as mere mortals question any of the Lord's deeds? That's all I can say that it's, we need to just see the love of God. Even here, there are already moves to make all these uh, people who died in church, there are moves to beatify and canonize them as saints in the Roman Catholic Church because they died soon after having received the Holy Eucharist. So that is the view of the church. Love, love is what is important. So what made you select uh, this career, uh, Mr. Borera? I mean, I mean, there, there would have been, I'm sure, so many other careers that you could have opt for. Well, what is the logic? I mean, how did it happen? <laughs> I, it was a choice between two careers. Uh, I, when I was in school, in the advanced level, I asked my father's permission that I could embark on that first career. But he said, you must... Uh, have some sort of education before you embark on that career. And thereafter, uh, I started doing law. I fell in love with it and carried on. And subsequently, when my father died in 1996, I was the only one who was at home. And as you said, I looked after my mother with great love. And there was nobody to look after her. So ultimately, she became the child I never had. And then it was too late to embark on another career. So I decided to continue in this career. So, I mean, if uh, there is so much of challenge in this career that you have selected, um, I mean, when you see sometimes 
um, the injustice that happens around uh, uh, around not only the world but in Sri Lanka also, you know, uh, which I don't want to go into detail. But what is your youngster to a um, uh, to a student who is studying law? My advice to a youngster is, law is not an easy profession. It is very hard, hard work. You need to put in a lot of hard work. And you cannot, it's not like, uh, well, having been born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Because how, even if you come from a legal background, you still have to work. And my advice, to any, anyone who is wanting to take a legal career is there is no elevator to success. You must climb the stairs. Hard work, devotion, and honesty are integral elements of the legal profession. Uh, Mr. Perra, if I just go back to um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, what was the what was the reaction uh, from this very eminent uh, gentleman? Um, I mean, uh, uh, he was one of the most uh, sought after pediatricians, Dr. Cyril Pereira, who was actually, um, who's your dad. What, what was his reaction when you decided to be a lawyer and, and, and not that you wanted to follow his footsteps? Well, uh, Rohan, my eldest brother, was really his dearly beloved son. He followed him in his footsteps and now he's, he's also identically, the identical profession he has. He's a consultant pediatrician. And I had a, my youngest brother also took to medicine. And my third brother decided to do engineering. So as far as I was concerned, I must tell you, variety is the spice of life. <laughs> so I decided <laughs> that <laughs> there must be another profession. Because my father always used to, he was very keen that all of us did our studies. That was something he was very keen on. And he used to tell us, the seeds of learning are bitter, but the fruit is sweet. So I decided in my legal career and he didn't object because he knew that that was an equally good profession. So uh, uh, how has a lawyer's life changed um, because of the pandemic, uh, Mr. Pereira? I mean, most of our lives have changed. You know, we, uh, we suddenly realized that uh, our eight to five jobs are gone. You know, you're right now, um, you know, you, you work, you know, right across the time zones. Uh, we suddenly realized that uh, in Nomo is a time when uh, your, your furniture at home is your furniture for your use, but now it's, it also belongs to your total office because, you know, you're working from home sometimes. So right across, you have huge changes taking place. Um, well, how has a lawyer's life changed due to the pandemic? Yeah, if you ask the question, how does a lawyer's life change and how my life has changed, I would first tell you how my life has changed. First, because this brings about, this pandemic actually is a situation which nobody would have fathomed two years ago. Nobody. Now we are come to, we have come to terms with something which we never even thought about. In other words, you have to look 
beyond the pandemic and must be you know we must be ready at an, an instant's notice to leave to leave this world are we ready the pandemic has shown me personally that we have to be ready because this can strike any one of us at any time so the question is are we ready are we prepared to leave everything and go you know in 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 the uh, christian t- tradition in the christian bible there is this famous quote vanity of vanities and all is vanity except to love god and to serve him alone so whatever attachments we have to our profession to our riches whatever else is absolutely insignificant if we are not ready to leave and even even in the buddhist philosophy if i may tell that in singhala there is a very similar quote sielu sanskaryo anityai mama wagema mama magema kiyala deyak neta sama deyakma venas vana suluya venas novana ekama de venas vimai so in my opinion this pandemic has taught me to trust the unknown future to a known god and to be ready to leave at any time as far as the legal provision is concerned the further question is we can still work from home we can do our opinions we can do our submissions all that can be done from home and now there are moves even to have uh, even that still coming even to have zoom uh, meeting zoom trials etc in fact last week uh, myself and my junior we had a zoom uh, trial in the district court of kalambo where we cross examined the witness who was from dubai so our courts are equipped to handle that we, we cross examined him the witness came on zoom and we cross examined him via zoom we did this in the commission a number of times but to my knowledge this was the first time that this happened in the district court of kala um mr parara i know you had prepared uh, a very in depth presentation and you know we had prepared a set of questions also that we were going to discuss but then after yesterday's decision that came in you know uh, for many legal reasons uh, which you mentioned at the outset uh, um, you know we have to uh, abide by the law of the land uh, there are a few questions that people are asking i hope it's okay if i um, and you are please free free to say that you you would not in a position to answer but is it okay if i just yeah, of ask a few questions okay um it says um from rushing what are the legal implications in taking actions on perpetrators of the east attack can you repeat that please what are the legal implications in taking action on the perpetrators of the east attack yeah yeah now there are, there is there are no legal implications because already action has been instituted against 25 perpetrators so i don't know what what is meant by legal implications but uh, action has already been the, the process has begun okay there's another one presumably uh, that question was before action was instituted i would think but now the action was instituted yesterday indictments were filed uh, well now the the flow has started so we just had to go go with the flow another question which has been brought out is uh, respected pc 
we can see a lot of speech in the parliament about these attacks which are also recorded in the hansard why still can find why still can't we find the truth about it uh rohan ka as speaker dosa tribulate statements that were made in parliament those who are in parliament uh can make those statements but if they if they really wanted to make various allegations then uh, they could have come before the commission and laid out their facts so that the commission could have inquired into those matters having uh, it's too late now and the commission sittings have finished for them to now make various allegations that this was not done or that was not done that is a simple answer um so um i just like to ask i indicated to you there were there were public notices for it there were public two public notices one public notice was due both public notices were during the tenure of the former government so so if they wanted to they could have come forward and asked to give evidence uh there's a, another question coming in is this case allocated for a special trial at bar or will it be a usual process if this is to be heard in a special trial at bar what would be the process it's a special trial at bar now the next step is for the uh, uh, chief chief justice to nominate three judges to have a trial at bar that's the next process so now it's up to him now to nominate three judges of the high court to have a trial at bar so what what is meant by trial at bar is it's a trial at bar without the jury right so uh, the general questions are here it says how should a junior counsel conduct himself in court as well as outside the court very interesting question well the junior is the a junior counsel you or myself i was also a junior at one point and i was a junior to a very very respected senior mr uh, seth kaula president's counsel and it's really up to the senior to show the junior how things should be done and automatically generally the juniors follow the seniors to the letter so if if you are a junior and if you are working under a senior president's counsel then his advice and his guidance is imperative in his uh, practice so uh, i'm sorry i'm i'm just asking questions which are sometimes very thought provoking but what are the traditions and practices that should always remain and carry forward a noble profession like yours there are a number of traditions there are there are a whole long list of traditions if i might just name a few of them uh, when you are a, a junior in the profession and if you walk into a courthouse and the courthouse uh, and there are the, you find the scene if you are seated down and you find a senior especially a senior silk uh, walking into the courthouse the accepted practice sometimes of course it is practiced in the breach is for the junior to immediately get up and offer his seat to the senior that is what we were taught and that is a tradition that should be emulated and then always if you if you are if you are with a senior always walk behind the senior not in front of him and always show respect to the seniors in the profession even when you are opposed to senior president's counsel or senior counsel always show respect to them that works both ways even the seniors must show respect to juniors but the juniors in particular must not get the must not have the attitude that they are high and mighty it's a long long ladder that we have to climb 
and it's not an easy uh, climb to the top. You cannot sort of parachute to the top. Juniors must learn that they cannot parachute to the top. The most important, something which I have told all my juniors, and I'm happy and I'm proud that they follow that, is simplicity. Simplicity is the hallmark of a junior. Never think that you know everything in life. You know, at 23, one would think one knows it all. But at 40 years, one would find that you really don't know even one hundredth of that which you thought you knew, knew everything at 23. That is what is important. Simplicity. For us lawyers, we still learn. I am still learning. So it's an entirely, it's a learning process. Till you die, it's a learning process. Um, so I'd like to just introduce uh, Dr. Tathura Vannasurya, who actually heads uh, the law school. Uh, he also has a few questions that he yeah, would like yeah. to ask. Uh, yeah. Chaturo, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunter. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, yes. Being a lawyer, I know that I can see so many questions uh, uh, directed at you from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, participants. Yes. Uh, but uh, we know we have a, doc a very uh, important doctrine called sub judici. So I, I know that are the limitations that we have. Yes. So, uh, sir, because of that, I'm trying to confine to uh, more for general questions. Yes. So, uh, sir, a uh, couple of my friends are uh, your juniors. And now I know how uh, well you look after them. Sometimes you take them abroad as well. And uh, so, uh, and also you have been well known in the profession for looking after juniors. So my question is, uh, when a junior lawyer should start his own practice, at what point they should start their own practices? From, uh, I'm talking about from uh, working with a senior and then to start his own practice as a own, own lawyer. Yeah, I, I would say uh, for the first, seven, eight years, you have to work with a senior lawyer because you really don't know the ropes, especially in the civil practice. I am a civil practitioner. There is so much of procedure that is involved that you really need to practice with a senior lawyer to understand the nuances and uh, everything associated with the profession. Thereafter, you can branch out on your own. As you know, now the practice is, I would say, there are, there are too many lawyers. So, so it's uh, for a junior to start off immediately is very, very difficult. It's, it's, uh, it's an impossible task. There are so many lawyers. So if, if a junior has the opportunity of working with a senior, then that is the best. And to continue working with that senior until he knows his work for the first couple of years, maybe seven, eight, nine years. Okay, thank you, sir. I have one more question, if you permit me. Uh, yes, of course. So, uh, so these days, sir, uh, uh, as you mentioned that we have too many lawyers these days. So. And also there are so many questions in the society also as to the role uh, a lawyer can play. So uh, according, to your according to your knowledge, so what, uh, what, uh, what type of role a lawyer should play uh, according to the current requirement? Can you say what type of role, uh, what is expected of a lawyer in society? Is that what yes, sir. For, yeah. uh, to help the society for the betterment probably. The most important thing, to my mind, the most important thing is a lawyer must always, unfortunately, the legal profession, it, it's, it's uh, uh, dishonesty is rampant. So the role of a lawyer must start off from their, their honesty and integrity are basic elements. There is a famous saying that honesty is the best quality. 
that is why i i can see honesty is not a quality it is a duty the duty that we owe to ourselves to court to opposing counsel and most importantly to our, to our own god it's very very important that is what the the, the what should be ingrained in a lawyer did i answer your question oh. yes of course thank you so much doctor and uh, so thank you so much sir uh, over to you dr rohan sir thank you uh, dr chatur and i appreciate sincerely for taking part in the in this program uh, so there is one more how will the gazette notification of 2218 stroke 68 help to deradicalize detainees what is the step by step approach for rehabilitation i'm not sure whether this is yeah, um, I, i was told i was told I, i may be wrong but i was told this evening that uh, as i told you i am not sure about it but i was told this evening that the supreme court had issued a, a notice staying that yes it so i'm not too sure about it because that had happened today so I'm, i can't comment much on that uh so there is um we see a lot of lawyers uh enrolled as attorneys at law uh most of them don't have the opportunity to work in the chamber of an eminent council like you uh you know what is your solution uh because we see most of lawyers now getting into business well <laughs> how do we sort this situation uh <laughs> law is getting into business as long as it's within the bounds of their profession is completely in order uh, but but one solution is for more seniors to open up their chambers a certain seniors only have one or two juniors whereas they can afford to have much more than that uh, so one main solution is to open up the chambers and enable juniors know that know that the pro the helping a junior is you're helping the profession your own profession so there is one way and of course now there are a lot of opportunities in the corporate sector as well for lawyers lots of opportunities in the corporate sector for lawyers not only that there is there is a, 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 if not for this pandemic there is a lot of opportunity uh, even abroad for for lawyers so there is no dearth of opportunity but as you say quite rightly there are too many lawyers and when there are too many lawyers then the result of that is there is a lot of backstabbing a lot of dishonesty those things also come up so i don't know how we are going to stop this but i think the best way is to create more opportunities for members of the legal profession well they can there are even opportunities of becoming magistrates uh labor tribunal presidents of 3 4 years in practice so those opportunities are also there for them to join the judicial field there there's a question coming up so it says uh the organizations that were recommended to be banned by the presidential commissions have not yet been banned would you be in a position to give you a view on this or shall we pass the question uh that is not that is actually the purview of the government uh, so that is not a question that i can answer uh, so i think it's it's uh, it's not within my purview to answer that question so i am not a lawyer by profession uh but i but i'm told that i think uh the the second chief justice of sri lanka sir edward jayatilaka is 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 uh, is i think related to you and so where do you go from here sir i mean i'm a not i'm not lawyer but where do you go from here uh, after you you know you you been uh, fighting so many cases for social cause so what's a normal career path that normally people pass through well, there, there is a career path of going uh, joining the judiciary but uh, 
those avenues uh, are not, in, uh, not much of interest to me. Uh, I would continue in my legal profession. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, I think it's uh, fantastic um, having a very honest discussion. Um, uh, and uh, I know that you were in a very difficult situation yesterday because uh, of the, the 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 decisions that came into play, and then you know you have to reverse slightly some of your presentations that you're going to make, but you're yet honored by coming in for today's program, and it's actually an honor to have you. And can I hand over to Dr. Chatura for the concluding remarks, please? Dr. Chatura. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohanta. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Shamil Pereira, President's Council. Uh, Mr. Shamil Pereira will be pleased to hear that APIT Graduate School, uh, in collaboration with Staffordshire University in the United Kingdom, offers an internal LLM uh, degree. And the dominant goal of uh, APIT uh, Graduate School is to provide high standard, high standard of legal education in an encouraging and interactive learning environment, uh, which in turn produces graduates who can contribute constructively to the development of the legal profession. And our LLM program is designed to encourage students to develop an understanding of legal concepts, working methods of the law, acquire technical expertise in solving legal problems, and cultivate a critical awareness of the current legal environment. So, sir, thank you so much for your time and also your, the knowledge that you shared. Uh, it was uh, so much uh, detailed and also uh, it was thought-provoking session. And uh, we would uh, we hope that you will continue to uh, have a, a very healthy relationship with Abit. And we are looking forward to invite you in the future as well. Thank you so much for your time, sir. We really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you.